Mary Spake needs our prayers for her severe back pain that is uh, troubling her. We have uh, Carrie West and uh, Oliver are real sick and in need of prayers. And Betty Hill uh, is having some health, is health issues. There are others uh, in our bulletin that are sick and need our prayers, so please see your bulletin for additional uh, needs there. There will be a teacher's meeting uh, next Sunday morning after the morning service. We're going to meet down front. So if you're a teacher or interested in teaching, uh, please participate in that meeting. That'll be next Sunday morning. Also, there is a youth activity, uh, a game night that's planned for August the 28th at 6 p.m. That's the last Sunday in or last Saturday, excuse me, the last Saturday in August, 6 p.m. See Josh and Amber if uh, you need additional details. Our order of service tonight, Micah Perry will be leading our first prayer. Our closing prayer is Brother Danny Brown, and Brother Patton Garrett will be reading our scriptures in just a minute. And our brother Bob Garrett will be leading uh, our singing after our scripture reading with Pat. If you would like to join me, I will be reading from Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and I will begin my reading in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost, lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection resurrect, yeah, uh, from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfect, perfected, but I press on that I may lay Hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid for me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the, up, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. 
for a prayer with sin number 62. 62. you and to fellowship in your name. We ask that you guide us in our worship of you and please help us to make the right choices. Please help those who were unable to attend tonight, who were sick or injured, and please guide our minds to focus on you and in Christ's name we pray. Amen. One twenty five, a bear song of exhortation. If you want to mark your books, one twenty five. Do that now. Forever hold to peace. Before the lesson, we're going to sing number two hundred. Number two hundred. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, he soldiers of the
says, right, we're studying the book of Philippians, chapter 3. Brother Patton read uh, a section of that chapter. And the section which he read is what we covered in our last study when we studied in Philippians. It's been a while. But this year, uh, from time to time, on Sunday nights, we've done studies in the book of Philippians. We've had a couple of lessons from chapter 1, a couple from chapter 2. And now then, this is our second lesson from chapter 3. Here's a letter from Paul the prisoner to a congregation that he had a great relationship with. He considered them to be his joy and crown. And he writes this letter of encouragement to them. Now, before we get to our passage tonight, we're going to be looking at the last five verses in chapter 3. But in chapter 3, before you get there, what do you see? Well, in the first verse, we see the idea of rejoicing in the Lord. In the next couple of verses, we learn that the real circumcision, well, that's those folks who, who worship God in spirit, okay? They're followers of the Christ. Then Paul speaks about his background, what kind of person he was, from what kind of family did he come. And then in that section that Brother Garrett read for us, uh, beginning in about verse 7, Paul speaks about the things that he gave up because Christ is everything to him. And so tonight, then, we're going to consider the last section in chapter 3, beginning in verse 17 and going through verse 21. Verse 17, the Bible says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which also, which walk so as you have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to even to subdue all things unto himself. I've simply gone through these verses and, and plucked out some ideas. And it's no secret tonight where we're going in this lesson. We're going to just walk through those points individually. And so we're going to look first of all at the idea from verse 17 that there's this idea of conforming with something. You see there in verse 17, there's an appeal to the Philippian brethren to be followers or imitators of what? Or of whom? Imitators of Paul. And he said, you have us for an example. The word example is from a, a Greek word, tupos, which means type, and it can be translated as example or pattern. And so what do you do when you have a pattern? You conform to the pattern. Paul's not talking about using material to make a piece of clothing. He's talking about a lifestyle. You say, well, why would a human being say to another human, imitate me? Well, in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, the message is, be followers or imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so as long as Paul is imitating Jesus, then it's proper for us to imitate him, conform to his pattern. When Paul wrote a letter to a, a Christian by the name of Titus, he said to Titus, you be a pattern of good works, Titus 2 and verse 7. Look in your Bible in Philippians 4, verse number 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, you do them. And the God of peace shall be with you. Just suppose we make this general question. If a human being wants God to be with him, 
What does that person need to do? Well, we, we might give a number of answers that would all be accurate because they'd be scriptural. But in Philippians 4 and verse 9, the message is, if you want God to be with you, then you act like Paul. Somebody says, I don't know if I feel comfortable with Paul lifting himself up and said, hey, everybody be like me. Well, remember this. Paul's not writing from his own thinking. He's guided by the Holy Spirit to write that message. And so this idea of conforming to a pattern as we study the scriptures and we see Bible characters and we see their lifestyle and we see their attitude and we see their speech, we have to filter that through the message of the scripture to come to a conclusion. Is this a good example or is this not a good example? Even in the case of Paul, what did he say about himself? He said, I have to buffet myself. I have to discipline myself to make sure that I'm conforming to God's pattern. So as you start here in verse 17 tonight, here's this idea of conforming to a pattern. But our second word that we're looking at with C, as you can see, is the word cross. Here the word cross is a noun, not the verb like don't cross me. No, it's a noun. Look at verse 18. For many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. We're talking here about a specific cross. How many different crosses have humans made or manufactured in history? I'd have no, I'd have no idea. But we're talking here about a specific cross. It's called the cross of Christ. You might recall that Paul in another place wrote to the churches of Galatia. He said, I'll basically not glory or boast in anything except the cross of Christ. What's that song we sing when I survey the wondrous cross? Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save or accept in the death of Christ my Lord. Well, what is there about that cross that makes it special? It's not the wood itself, right? It's not the way the cross was put together. It's not the ones who put him on the cross. But it's the power of the blood that was shed on the cross. The preaching of the cross to some folks is foolishness. But unto us who are saved, it's the what? It's the power of God, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. So how might we describe the cross of Jesus? What adjectives might we apply to the cross of Jesus? Well, there's no limit. Well, that's true. But it definitely was a cross of suffering. Torture that we would describe as unthinkable and inhumane. And Isaiah gave a picture of that in what we call Isaiah 53, a, a chapter that from beginning to end is a prophecy about the coming Messiah. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed. What comes to mind when you think about being wounded and having stripes inflicted on your body? You think about pain. It was a cross of suffering. But not only was it a cross of suffering, it was a cross of sacrifice. Hold your place here. Look in your Bible in Hebrews 10. And throughout the book of Hebrews, you'll see a contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament you'll see a contrast between the activities of the old covenant high priest and our new covenant high priest, Jesus. In chapter 10, here's a contrast. Verse 11, and every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins, but this man, that's Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. They made daily sacrifices. 
They made sacrifices when there were an occasion arose from the Israelites. How many sacrifices did Jesus make that brought about mankind's redemption? One. So when we think in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 18 about the cross or the cross of Christ, it was the cross of suffering. It was the cross of sacrifice and it was the cross of salvation. Not only did he endure stripes, but as it says in Isaiah 53 and is quoted in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, by his stripes we are what? Healed. There's healing power in the blood of Jesus. That's not talking about physical healing. It's talking about spiritual healing or spiritual cleansing from our sins. The cross of Christ. That's how God draws men to himself through the message of the cross. So Paul speaks here the idea of conforming to this pattern. He speaks about the cross of the Christ, and he also speaks about what we're simply calling corruption. Because when you look at verse 18, he speaks about a specific group of humans. Verse 18, in my Bible, it's in parentheses. You've got the way Paul walks in verse 17, and you've got others who walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the what? The enemies of the cross of Christ. And because they're the enemies of the cross, they are a corrupting influence in this world. Their message is corrupt. Their influence is corrupt. In an ideal world, every person would learn the gospel and obey the gospel. And in an ideal world, every person who communicates a religious message would teach only the truth of God's word. You and I know that's not how it happens in real life. Not every person learns the gospel, not every person who learns the gospel complies, and not everyone who communicates a message teaches the truth. In the language of the God of heaven, there were human beings and there still are human beings who are the enemies of the cross of the Christ. Well, what does that make you if you're an enemy of the cross? If you're an enemy of the cross, you're an enemy of the one who died on the cross, right? Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad, Matthew 12 in verse 30, someone might wonder, well, is it really that big of a concern that there are people in the world now and who were at that time, is it really that big of a concern that there are enemies of the cross? Well, it was of concern to Paul. It was of a concern to the God of heaven because he, the God of heaven, had his servant Paul write a message about it. And it says in verse 18, how many people are walking as enemies of the cross? We don't have a number. We don't have a specific. But what's that word there in verse number 18? For many, M-A-N-Y, many. We're not talking about a rare occurrence. Many. Hold that thought. We think perhaps two or three decades later, John wrote the book of 1 John. And John's message to the Christians to whom he was writing was, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test or try the spirits, for there are many false prophets going out into the world. What kind of people are we talking about, John? Prophets. What kind of prophets? False. How many? Many. And so Paul writes this letter and says there are many enemies. Well, I wonder if that's a topic which Paul addressed one time in his life. Check it off my list. I've warned people one time, that's enough. What does your Bible say in verse 18 of Philippians 3? For many walk of whom I have told you, what? Often. Paul, can't you, can't you be more positive? I'm being positive in telling you to watch out for enemies of the cross because they are corruption. They are hindering people from obeying the Christ who died on the cross. Well, Paul, what did that do to you emotionally as you often had to talk about the enemies of the cross? 
He says, and I now tell you even what? Weeping. You certainly don't get the idea that Paul got out of bed in the morning and said, I just can't wait to go and talk about these enemies. It broke his heart. It broke his heart to know that there was such a corrupting influence in the world. Well, who would fit into the category of being an enemy of the cross? Well, anyone then and anyone now who would oppose the one who died on the cross, they would be enemies of the cross. You remember as Jesus was hanging there for about six hours, there were some who passed by and said, look at that, he saved others and he can't even save himself. They said, you come down and we'll, we'll believe for sure. They made a mockery of him. When you make a mockery of the cross, you're making a mockery of the one who died there and that's just not gonna cut it in the eyes of God. So, belittling, making fun of the one who died there, that person would be, whether intentional or not, an enemy of the cross. One who was not opposed to the concept of Jesus dying on the cross, but who says there's no benefit in him dying, his blood has no power, they would be an enemy of the cross. And one who says, yeah, his blood has the power to wash away sins, but it has nothing to do with the church. The church is of zero importance. That person is an enemy of the cross because Jesus used his blood to purchase something. What was it? To purchase the church of God. Acts 20 and verse 28. Now, how does God through Paul describe those enemies? Look at verse number 19. Their end is what? Destruction. If you got time and want to investigate, turn over sometime and look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and almost that entire chapter is about false teachers. And Peter says their end is going to be destruction or perdition. Well, do they have a God? According to verse 19, they have a God. What's their God? Their tummy. <laughs> you say, what? That's what it says. Romans 16, you got the same answer. Their God is their belly. That is the efforts that they put forth. The bottom line is they're doing something to benefit themselves. It's all about themselves. It says their glory is their shame. They may think that they have great honor and glory and Paul said it's their shame and Paul said their mindset is they mind earthly things. That is the instruction of the Bible is we're to set our affections on things above. These folks don't do that. And so Paul warns them about this corrupting influence. And then he talks about citizenship. New King James's conversation, conversation in the King James normally has reference to what? Conduct or lifestyle? Citizenship in heaven. There was an instance in the life of Jesus when he had sent out 70 disciples to go and preach. And they came back and those disciples, they were ecstatic. Why? Because they'd been able to cast out demons. Remember what Jesus told them? And I'm, I'm paraphrasing and summarizing. Jesus said, well, don't, don't, don't be ecstatic about having the power to cast out demons, but rather rejoice because your names are written where? In heaven. Luke 10 and verse 20. People who have their names written in heaven, people who have their names in the book of life, and when they enter into heaven, it's like, okay, we've been waiting on you. We knew you were coming. Been waiting on you. Abraham looked for a city which hath foundation as builder and maker as God, Hebrews 11 and verse 10. And as I often mention, we have an inheritance out of this world. It's what? Incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away, reserved where? In heaven. And because our citizenship in heaven, our names are written in heaven, our inheritance is in heaven, God's people ought to be heaven-focused, heaven-oriented people. We look at the next one then. Something about a coming. Look at verse 20. For our conversation or citizenship is in heaven from whence or from where also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would we look for Jesus from heaven? Because he's going to be coming. 
Bible's message is clear. Jesus came into the world, right? Has Jesus already come into the world? He did once, right? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, 1 Timothy chapter 1. And verse number 15, he came and took on the the form of a human, lived among men, and gave his life on the cross. But the reference here is not looking to Jesus to come the first time, but it's looking to Jesus to come for the final time. As soon as Jesus ascended into heaven, two messengers of God spoke to the apostles who were looking up into heaven, and they said, you men of Galilee, Why stand you gazing up into heaven? For the same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. Acts 1 and verse 11. What was the the prediction? This same Jesus shall come, he's coming, in the manner that you've seen him go. Well, is he going to send somebody as his representative? Oh, no, he's coming personally. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, for the Lord himself, the Lord himself shall descend. And Jesus promised the apostles, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That where I am, there you may be also. It's not a question of whether or not he's coming. He's coming. The question each of us and every other human needs to ask self is this. Am I ready? Well, I I plan to be one day. Well, then you're not ready now. If being ready for his coming is only a plan for the future, that's an indication that we're not ready now. Jesus said, watch and wait. For an hour that you know not, the Son of Man is coming. He came once to be our Savior. He'll come again to be our judge. Now let's look at the final point. A change is coming. The New King James has the word transform. Verse number 21. Who shall change or transform our vile body? Now the word vile in the King James may make it sound like it's just nasty. That's not what it means. What's the New King James has the word lowly body? Why do we have lowly bodies? Not because we're short and low to the ground. We have lowly bodies simply means it's a body that's what? It it works here on earth, okay? We remember, we we read in 1 Corinthians 15 that a change is coming and that change is gonna come in the twinkling of an eye. Not all will be raised. He said, what's wrong with those folks that won't be raised? They'll still be alive. The only way to be raised from the dead is first you've got to die. So when Jesus comes again, they'll, some, some folks still will be alive. They're going to be changed. Why does there have to be a change? There's going to be a transformation. There's going to be a changing. Why? Because this corruptible has to put on incorruption. Right? No, this must put on incorruption. Yeah. This mortal must put on immortality. Simply this. The kingdom of God or heaven... This body we now have is not suitable for that spiritual environment. I know where we're going with this question, don't you? Well, preacher, what kind of body you reckon we're going to have? Well, I got a little part of an answer in verse 21. Who shall change our vile or lowly body that may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? Are you saying, preacher, that we're going to have a body... Kind of like Jesus's? Uh, No, we're not using the word kind (laughs) of. We're going to have a body like the body Jesus has now. You say, what kind's he got? I have no clue. I know it's suitable for heaven. 1 John chapter 3 and and, and verse 1, we shall be like him when he comes. What do you mean we're going to be like? We're going to have that kind of body. You say, well, that that bothers you. Don't let it bother you. Don't lose any sleep. It's one of those things. It's in whose hands? It's in God's hands. The Lord's going to raise the dead. They'll have a changed body. For those who are alive, they're going to be changed. Who's going to make that change take place? God is. 
He said, well, do, do I need to study up and make sure I pass the exam? No, no, it's not that kind of exam. It's gonna happen in the twinkling of an eye. And so the main question is not what kind of body we're gonna have. That's interesting. But the main question is, what does it take for a human to be ready? And number two, am I ready? Am I ready now? And so these are some of the points we see in this passage. As Paul wanted to give them a sense of calm, there is corruption in the world, but we can be faithful to Jesus. There's a change coming, but we can be faithful to Jesus. And so a sense of calm and confidence as corruption and change come. We talked about conforming to the pattern that Paul set, the cross of Christ, the corrupting influence of the enemies of the cross. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where our gold is for where your treasure is. What? There will your heart be also. We talked about his coming and we talked about the change that's going to take place. Death is certain. Change is certain. Judgment is certain. We want to make certain that we're ready for that occasion before we leave here tonight. Brother Bob has selected a song of encouragement, a song in which we reflect on what the Lord's done for us and when we consider where do we stand. If you're here tonight and you've never obeyed the gospel, the cross of Christ, the power of Jesus, his blood to wash away every sin, do you not believe Jesus is the Son of God? Do you not have a heart that wants to please him and turn from your sins in repentance? The courage to confess your faith and then the desire to be baptized for the remission of sins. You could do that tonight. For here is a child of God and need the prayers of the saints. It's God's invitation as you stand and we sing together.
us pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly bow at this time to offer our thanks for this bread, which represents Christ's body shed on the cross. As we partake of this bread, we pray that we do it in a manner pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dear Father, for this cup, which represents Christ's blood shed on our behalf, we are thankful, and we pray as we examine ourselves and partake of this cup that we do it in a manner that pleases Thee. In Christ's name, amen. to give. Now, my Father, we offer our prayer of thanks for all that we receive from thy hand and the opportunity that we have to return a portion. We pray that we do it with a cheerful heart. In Christ's name, amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and all the many blessings. We thank you for letting your son come and die on the cross to save us from our sins. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to come worship your word in freedom without fear. May we have it forever. Father, we ask you to be with the sick and help bring them back to good health. We ask you to be with the shut-ins, Father, to help keep them safe, keep them healthy, and keep them strong and fast in their faith. Father, we ask you to be with the elders and leading your church. And Father, we ask you to take us in our homes, guide, guard, and direct us, bring us back to the next appointed hour. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> 